Uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the second meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Uh, could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are on silent. It's acceptable to use mobile phones for social media but not to uh, record uh, or film proceedings or take photographs. Um, agenda, item one, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. T today's decision uh, is whether we agree our consideration of the evidence we'll receive on the draft proposal and statement of reasons on the transplantation authorisation of removal of organs, etc. Scotland Bill, uh, whether that should be taken in private at future meetings. It's normal practice for us, uh, the committee, to consider the evidence received in private. Can we agree that, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, second item on the agenda is an evidence session with the Scottish Health Council. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Richard Norris, Director of Scottish Health Council, Pam Whittle, uh, Chair, Scottish Health Council, and Robbie Pearson, Chief Executive, Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Could I uh, invite the panel to make an opening statement? Um, as members will know, the Scottish Health Council was established in 2005. And the reason for establishing it was to ensure, support, and monitor the effectiveness of NHS boards involvement of patients and the public and their activities um, and uh, originally it was housed or set up within the confines of quality improvement scotland but um, now it is part um, since the reform act of um, healthcare improvement scotland um, it's got 14 local offices across scotland and within the context of the Health Care Improvement Scotland budget, it's got around £2.3 million. Pounds. So our local offices um, support a range of um, activities with communities, um, and they do provide advice, facilitate and support events, but they do that in the context of supporting the NHS. Um, they, but at the same time, they work with third sector, with um, lots of different networks, and evaluate activities and try and build skills and confidence. Uh, the local offices gather, do gather patient and public views on a wide variety of topics, um, often through uh, local discussion groups or by street canvassing. Um, and in, examples include the recent review of maternity and neonatal care, which the Scottish Health Council supported by delivering a programme of engagement activities um, across Scotland. And they talk to a wide and diverse range of groups, 65 in, in total, as well as one-to-one -one discussions and questionnaires um, to get those different range of views. Um, more recently, the Scottish Health Council has been involved in the delivery of Our Voice, which is the more um, recent initiative around gaining public views, um, and has worked very closely with the Scottish Government, with COSLA, with the Health and the Social Care Alliance, and others to introduce this new approach. And this perhaps is a, is a, is a more um, visible role for the Health Council in terms of public engagement, rather than simply um, ensuring that um, health boards are engaged in public involvement. So um, there have been a lot of issues raised um, during the time that I've been chair of the Scottish Health Council. And the introduction of uh, Our Voice has added to some of those changes in the way services are delivered. And we have recognised this, and we are, um, the, I am, as, what, as uh, one of the joint chairs of the rather separate uh, review, which is currently taking place um, of the Scottish Health Council. Um, that review has not reported yet, and so I will be extremely interested in hearing the views expressed today to ensure that those views are also considered as part of that review. Okay, thank you. Uh, Donald. Um, thank you very much. Thanks to the committee uh, for coming in for their submission. Sorry, to, to the panel for their um, submission. Can I ask about the um, independence of um, the council? Um, you're a committee of Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, that is uh, a non-territorial health board, as we all know, uh, and it, re it, it sits under the Scottish Government. What response do you give to widespread concerns uh, about the Council's independence uh, from both um, Healthcare Improvement Scotland uh, and from Government? 
And on the subject of independent scrutiny, could you comment on what appears to be a, a very limited use of the independent scrutiny panels? Um, I think there have been three between 2007 and 2009, but, but none since then. The, the independent scrutiny panels have... Rich, um, Richard, can you answer that one? Um, yes, I mean, it, <coughs> excuse me. The decision to establish an independent scrutiny panel would be one that would be made by the Scottish Government. And I suppose, um, thinking back to when they were first established, um, they were a fairly new innovation. Um, I still think there may be occasions when they would be useful. But what I think is also what we've also seen happen is that quite often NHS boards um, also commission independent reports um, uh, to, you know, in terms of some of the clinical issues that they're facing. Um, and that's perhaps also a, a, sort of a development that's you know, happened because of independent scrutiny. There could still be independent scrutiny. Um, and we did provide a view some years ago to the Scottish Government that there was benefit in that because it did reassure members of the public uh, who maybe didn't have as much confidence as, they, as, they, as, as would be desirable uh, that there was, in a sense, clinical, good clinical and sound clinical evidence for making change. Um, so that's an area that I think is still something that could be potentially in the, in the light of the integration of health and social care services could be, a, could be something that would be useful. In terms of the issue around independence generally, um, the, although we are a, a governance committee of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the actual work of the committee is taken, is undertaken more or less sort of separately. Um, for example, when we are considering views about whether something is um, of any particular significance, we don't refer that to Healthcare Improvement Scotland. The committee itself has a minority of members who come from Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Five of the um, eight uh, committee members are not Healthcare Improvement Scotland board members. And they are um, appointed separately, totally separately. They are not um, appointed by ministers. Do you want to add anything to that, Robin? I think just to add, uh, it's important in terms of that distinctive identity of the Scottish Health Council. Um, whilst it operates within Healthcare Improvement Scotland, it is um, quite assertive in terms of retaining that um, independence. And that's particularly in the context of when we get into issues of um, major service change. So just, just to be clear, the, the decision to set up a scrutiny panel would be the government's decision? Yeah, so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Or, or, so how independent is that? Um, I, I think it's the set, it's it's the independent having an independent scrutiny panel. The decision to call one is is you, a, is the you, government. Can but you call it? Not at the moment. It's not within our guide. It's not within our guidance. Um, so therefore, our ability to, so it's only to call the government that. At the that can call yeah. that. Okay. But the actual appointment of the people would be independent. So that that process. Any, and, and you know this this impacts on any government. Um, if a government is does not want scrutiny, then it's unlikely it would form scrutiny panels. Does that does that logic follow? I think there's an important point of um, distinguishing between the the architecture around scrutiny, independent scrutiny panels and the independence of them. I think obviously it's up at the moment to government to call that. That is currently the arrangements. Um, and the important point, I think, in terms of the context of health care improvement in Scotland, but specifically Scottish Health Council, would be very clear in those instances where it is established that it would be absolutely independent of uh, Scottish government in establishing such a panel. Can I ask about the panel itself? Uh, the, the, sorry, the health committee. I'd, we look, we've got a former civil servant, a former council chief executive, former NHS chief executive, a solicitor, a former MSP and a consultant who gets the majority of her work from Scottish Government quangos. Do you, do you think that's a representative organisation? A former civil servant. Former senior civil servant. Yes. Former council chief executive. Yes. Former NHS chief executive. That's it. According to the list that I saw, there was more. Of, of of the health care committee? Scottish Health Council Committee. Committee, yes. A solicitor, a former MSP and a consultant. Uh, it's not a medical consultant. It's a... No, no, it's a consultant a cons who gets a majority yes. of their work from the Scottish Government. More or less, yeah. Yeah. 
Does that sound like a diversion representative uh, body? Um, if that's the organisation that's to okay. promote the patient voice. Um, I'm a bit no. I'm a bit concerned that you may have the wrong list. There are five. If I have, if I have I apologise. Yes. No. That's the list that I have. <laughs> there are there are five um, there are five council members. They um, one of them is a solicitor by profession, but doesn't work as a solicitor. One of them um, is a um, one of them is a sort of a, is is has got a special interest in older people and actually works with older people. Um, one of them works with uh, disabled groups and is um, and um, and the other one works with a housing group. So. Um, it doesn't sound... Before the end yes. of the meeting, we'll yes. come back to that, because there seems to be a bit of confusion. Yes, I, yes um, I'm, a bit, conf I'm okay. a bit confused. OK. Um, Alison. The Scottish Health Council um, is intended to improve patient focus, um, but uh, preparing for this morning, it seems that only just over a 1,000 people were engaged via social media and events um, in recent times, and... I think it's also fair to say that when constituents became aware that you were giving evidence this morning, I've, I've had several emails from people um, who are clearly unhappy um, that the Scottish Health Council isn't helping them to influence decisions that have a major impact on the delivery of health services in their area. I wonder if you have any comment on that. Um, I think, uh, Richard, this probably goes into the realms of how we engage with our local communities. Uh, more specifically, perhaps you would like to follow so, up. So, um, our role is, as, 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 as Pam has described, is to support boards to engage with local communities and support local communities to have their voice heard. Um, what we, what is not our role, is to campaign on behalf of local groups, and that's a that's an important distinction. Um, if there are groups who or communities who feel we've not done enough to, to help facilitate their voice to be heard then we're always interested to hear from them and think about how we can reflect on that and do more in that area. Um, but I think there is sometimes perhaps an issue about how, how, um, how, we, how we execute that role. That we, it's very important that people understand that we're not there to campaign on their behalf. If, if I may just come back, just because, mm -hmm. because we are pressed for time this morning, that's absolutely not. You know, the constituents who are contacting me do not have that misunderstanding. Um, they appreciate that it's a facilitative role. Um, but I just wondered what proactive work you might lead um, on a national basis with health boards to make sure that that participation is absolutely optimised and maximised. Convener, if I may, I think that's a fundamental part of the role of the Scottish Health Council because the, the original um, premise for establishing the Scottish Health Council was to ensure a more consistent approach for NHS boards in particular in engaging with local communities. And I'll ask Richard to say a little bit more about that in a moment. But one of the key things that comes out consistently in terms of engagement with communities is I'm always asking my voice and my views at the end of a process and not at the beginning. And I think one of the things that's fundamental to this and the learning, if we're going to have more fundamental and radical service change, is the importance of that voice being heard consistently at the start and not at the middle or, or indeed at the end of a journey. So I think that's an important message and that's heard loud and clear about the consistency and the quality of that engagement between NHS boards and the communities. But Richard, convener, if I may, may wish to say a little bit more about our overall approach to how we promote a more consistent and higher quality engagement with individuals and communities. So we work at a number of levels, so at the local level, um, where we, we have local officers in each territorial health board area, and they will give quite practical assistance and advice to boards, and they also meet with local communities. In terms of looking at the national, if you like, at the national picture, um, we, we, we developed a few years ago a participation standard, um, and we conduct um, biannual uh, processes whereby boards will look at that standard and we will verify the progress that they think they've made by talking to local communities. We've also published uh, a thing that we call the Participation Toolkit, which has a range of different engagement methods. There is no, there often isn't any one correct engagement method. It will often depend upon the context and on the issues. So there's a range of engagement methods in there. And what we'll do is we'll engage locally, once again, with boards and communities to help them decide, choose which engagement method would be the most appropriate. We also help out 
um, with evaluating board's activities, for example, as well. So there's a number of different things we do. We, we've also produced guidance where we feel that boards need a bit more help with understanding how to engage on a particular issue or topic. So um, when, for example, boards conduct option appraisal, it was very clear to us that the guidance and option appraisal that was produced by the Scottish Government and by the Treasury was very technical and boards were struggling with understanding how they could involve people meaningfully in that guidance. So we worked with patients, patient representatives and boards to develop some guidance to support meaningful engagement of uh, patients and community groups in that guidance. So those are some examples. There's a range of activities both at national and local level uh, that, we, that we carry out to, to, to support boards to do that engagement. Maybe just come back with yes, two please. quick questions on that point. Um, I'd be interested to know that um, participation standard or if NHS boards are self-assessing on <coughs> that, you know, is there any sanction if they're clearly not meeting an acceptable participation standard? And, you know, there's a public petition at the moment on a service change to a care home. There's questions about the, the efficacy and the consultation process. I just wonder what you see your role is in, you know, reducing the, the number of such cases where people feel compelled to take additional action. So the participation standard self-assessment and how to ensure people do feel satisfied with the processes we have in place. So on the participation standard, that was, that's, that does, uh, is designed to give comparative evidence across Scotland of how boards are engaging with communities. So we feed back to boards. Boards will self-assess, but then we'll go and talk about their assessment with people they've worked with and with local communities, and we will, that's, um, that's how we verify that. And we'll feed that back to boards in terms of how we feel they're making progress. Um, and as, uh, one example within that, for example, is how well they're using complaints and feedback, for example, to use that to improve services. And we conduct a, an assessment of that across Scotland every two years at the moment to look at that. Um, sorry, in terms of the, can I ask you a bit more about your point about the care home? Is that yeah, a particular you know, case? It, yeah, the, there's a public petition on a service change to a care home, and it's, it's questioning the it's questioning the consultation process. Now, I sort of feel if constituents were aware that the Scottish Health Council existed, would it not be the case that they would come to you to see what action you might take before it gets to that stage? So I'm just wondering, in terms of, you know, how aware is the is the general public that, that you exist? Um, on. In terms of care homes, I think one of the one of the issues that's arisen for us in terms of integration is our role in terms of social care and care homes. We have I know that we have been involved uh, in some examples where people have asked us for information. Um, but I think your point is right that we we our, our profile probably needs to now to be higher in the light of integration, in the light of that demand to understand how what are the best ways to engage. By that point, I'm getting a bit worried, uh, Mrs. Swittle, that you don't know your fellow board members. You've got yourself as the chair, who's a yeah. former senior civil servant. Yeah. George Black, who's a former yeah. chief executive of Glasgow City Council. John Glenny is a former chief executive of Borders Council. Yes. We've got Kim Schleeman, who's a solicitor. Elizabeth Cuthbertson, who's a consultant. Irene Oldfather, who's a former member of the Parliament. Uh, Marie Wong, who's a, a um, fitness consultant. And Alison Cox, who is a consultant who gets most of her work from the Scottish Government. That's the board. Are they diverse, representative and independent? That's the question I'm asking. They are certainly independent. And, and, they and are do you recognise that as the board? Yes, they are the board. They are the board. Thanks they are me. the board. It's just that when you describe them as being consultants, um, I no, don't... They, they describe themselves well, as yeah. consultants. Um, yeah. incident, uh, well, Elizabeth Cuth Cuthbertson actually works for a housing group, so I, I'm not sure you could count her as a consultant. But, uh, yes, no, I think... Um, I think that's that's what their professional background is, but in terms of them as individuals, um, they are very outspoken in support of the wider public. Okay, uh, Alex. <coughs> Good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, I, I'm going to pick up on some of the questions that Alison asked about uh, the role of the, um, the Health Council as being the patient voice, the, that level of engagement. We, I think we, we've 
discussed quite well, uh, but also to speak to a statement you made, Mr Pearson, about um, the Health Council being quite assertive in the area of major service change. Um, I've been an MSP for 10 months, and in that time I've made, I think, quite assertive representations to the Cabinet Secretary about three major service changes that my constituents are directly affected about around uh, changes, potential changes in St John's and Livingston, which serves uh, my constituents, um, it changes uh, the, the closure of cleft services at Edinburgh, um, and indeed the, the redesign around the Centre for Integrative Care, which many of my constituents travel great distance to, uh, to use. That's three major representations I've made in 10 months, but I can see that the Health Council has made six in six years and I'm just wondering what is the filtration to uh, what is the bar that you set where if you are acting as the patient voice how do you determine when you make a, a view available to the Scottish government and when you don't and it would seem that that's awfully few representations to make in the last six years. Can you that if I may make some opening remarks, I think that the first thing in terms of clarity is about the role of the, the, the Scottish Health Council. I think it's got probably three broad roles. I think the first is about promoting that consistency of engagement at a local level between NHS boards and um, communities and individuals and patients. I think the second is about support for that level of engagement and support. And the second, which I think has been quite a, a, a strong area of focus um, in, in the past year or so, is around that quality assurance of major service change. At any one time, there are around 35 to 40 different pieces of service change happening in Scotland in which the Scottish Health Council is engaged in providing support. Um, some of those reach the threshold in terms of what we would consider major service change. The position of the Scottish Health Council, just to be quite clear about it, is not there to make representations. It is there to, when it comes to service change, major service change, is to provide a quality assurance role of that and to offer a view to ministers as to whether that is major service change or not. So I think it's an important point in just distinguishing the role of Scottish Health Council in that. Ultimately, major service change in terms of the National Health Service is a matter for ministers ultimately uh, to, to decide upon. The other point um, you made was in respect of how assertive the Scottish Health Council is in terms of exerting its independence. Um, so one of the things that um, Pam Whittle said at the very start was about that distinctive uh, accountability for the Scottish Health Council sitting within Health Improvement Scotland. There is not a chain of command that takes decisions or views in respect of major service change back into the Board of Health Improvement Scotland. That is done quite distinct from the Board of Health Improvement Scotland. And I think it's important in giving confidence to the independence of the decision making of the Scottish Health Council that that is protected. Thank you. Commissioner Prime May. Um, so in the six views that you've offered on major service change, what, what would give us an idea of the anatomy of what that view would look like? What does it contain when you give it to the Scottish Government? I wonder, um, Convener, if I may hand that to, to Richard to elaborate upon, but we established at the same time the guidance came out, and Scottish Health Council did rather, in 2010, was <coughs> guidance around major service change and what the criteria was in respect of consideration of major service change. And perhaps... Um, Convener Richard may, um, on behalf of the, the attendees today, maybe set out a little bit more about what actual major service changing criteria is for consideration. Is contained in the specific views offered by the Health Council. Yes. Yeah. So when, uh, <coughs> when boards are um, looking at making a, a service change, um, the Scottish Government expects them to go to the Government with a view, with their own view as to whether that constitutes major service change or not. Um, and as part of that process, they ask them to come to us and to ask um, what our view would be of that. Now, it's not always possible to tell or to say at the start of a process um, whether that will become major or not. So you need sometimes to explore that a little bit further um, before it becomes clearer. Um, we, would, we would normally ask the boards to use our the guidance we produce that Robbie referred to on identifying major service change. It, what that does is identify a number of issues, nine in total, that are um, uh, areas which, which, if there's, in a sense, if, for example, if uh, one of them would be, if it's unscheduled or emergency care, for example, if, it, if the proposal concerns that, 
in our view, that makes it more likely that it should be seen as major. So we'd ask them to um, go, through, go through those nine issues and then give us their views on what they feel the issues are in terms of the service change they're proposing. What we would then do, we'd also, be, in a sense, we'd, we'd, we'd support the boards in, that, in their engagement with the community. We'd be present at some of those local meetings uh, and we'd talk to local community groups and patients groups. Um, what we then do is, in a sense, look at that information. Um, our staff and also uh, two, uh, four members of our committee uh, uh, would then meet to discuss the, the particular case and we would arrive at our own view of whether we felt that meets the threshold of major or not. And it's a subjective, it's not a science, it's, it's quite a subjective process. Um, one thing that we would do is we'd be very mindful of similar or close examples because we'd want to be consistent in the approach we take. So we'd look across Scotland and we'd say, are there similar examples uh, which would, would give us some idea of how, where this should sit. Um, and we would then provide our view to the board, and the board would then go to the government, and then the government would make their decision on whether they view that as major service change. Um, it's not a distinction that we think is always very helpful. Um, it implies that if it's not major, it's not important, or it's, and these changes are always important to the people who are affected by them. And we feel that sometimes it creates these, these two classes of service change, um, uh, which is, it seems to suggest that all service change falls in one or the other, but actually it's, it's more of a, a graded, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not just a, a binary issue. We're well aware, I mean, the reason why we would give our view is because we're thoughtful about advising on what would be a proportionate degree of engagement for that board. Would, would it require a formal consultation? We're aware that certainly recently from the point of some of the campaigning groups for them, the real issue here is the referral to the minister. And that's why, rightfully, it is a Scottish government decision on whether something is uh, deemed major or not, because that is entailed when it seems major. Here, and this is the rub, because the, this parliament passed a motion before Christmas, um, albeit an opposition-led motion, on um, the, the fact that we would expect the cabinet secretary to bring major service redesign to parliament, to at least have that scrutiny and that discussion. Um, my anxiety about this is that if we are setting the bar very high as to what we define as major service change, then whilst you know the, the government is not bound by that parliamentary motion, I think Parliament would take a dim view if if it, we didn't get a look in in this. But if we don't even get to the races with some of these because they can hide behind your views or your lack of view that this is a major service change, then they could decide not to bring it to Parliament at all. That's really a comment. You don't have to come back for that. Well, I've, I've got to pick up Mr. Cole Hamilton on that, and I'm extremely concerned by what he's seeing there as, as a, a clinician to think that this parliament would actually um, be preventing major service change, which is driven by a clinical need or by um, the lack of a clinical... Okay. Scrutinising. Well, I just wanted to clarify that there because that did concern me. I, I, I've got a background in, in health. I, I'm a nurse. Uh, I still am a nurse. Um, and I was involved in lots of quite major service changes over, over the course of my career. Um, and in particular involved in service changes and service redesigns as, in my role as a, as a, as a Unison Divisional Convener, some of which were uh, more welcome than others, shall we say. Um, and, but I, I, pre I fully appreciate that any service design causes anxiety to the service users and also to the staff who are involved in in running that service or managing that service. So can I can I ask the panel, you know, what what difference to a decision um, does some of the uh, media interest or public concern make to how you view services and, and whether it's a major or a minor change? It's one of our <coughs> excuse me. It's one of our nine categories. We, you know, one of the one of the one of the uh, one of the um, areas we say that needs to be looked at is the area of political and public concern. So we acknowledge that that in itself, uh, you know, is something that needs to be taken in, into account. Um, so it's 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 a, it's about trying to get the right balance, I suppose, um, between those different factors. And we were very clear. I mean, we were aware of the parliamentary debate. We were, we were very aware that we were being asked to give an independent view 
and we wanted to base our views on our normal process and where we'd be looking at this in, in the context of other changes. Um, and so that's what we wish to do. Um, it's not, if there is a high degree of public and political concern, that would make it more likely to be seen as major, but that in itself probably wouldn't be sufficient. You'd need to have other factors as well. Could you maybe elaborate on what those other factors are? Yes, so for example, uh, if, if uh, I mentioned earlier, one of the categories was whether it was emergency or unscheduled care, for example, um, we know that that's always likely to make it more, seem to be more likely to be major and from past experience if, it can, if it's concerned with uh, 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 unscheduled or emergency care. Um, the impact on patients, the number of patients that are affected, um, the experience of, in other parts of Scotland of similar proposals, um, the if, if any possible, if you like, knock-on effects or, 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 or uh, ways that that change could impact on other services. Um, so if, any, any, if there are any particularly strong financial issues concerned. Um, as I say, when we produced this list of nine issues, that was seven years ago, we consulted with health boards and with patients and the public and with professionals at the time. Um, our experience has been is, is that some of them tend to be more uh, used than others, if you like. Um, so certainly, uh, whether it's unscheduled or emergency care tends to be a very big factor, for example. And convener, if you would uh, allow me one thing. I think uh, throughout the, the, the hearings that this committee has had, we've, we've had lots of discussion about the changes that need to be made to the NHS, uh, the, the shift in resources from acute services into community services, uh, into the integrated joint boards, budgets and so on, and delivering care at different venues. How do you see your role in that process? Do you see more complaints coming to you? Do you see you being more active in uh, encouraging health boards or IGIBs to, to, to consult more widely? I'm just interested to see how you see the future of the Scottish Health Council with, with that as a background. The answer is yes. I think, uh, I, I, to, be, to be honest, I don't think there's any doubt that the role of the Scottish Health Council will need to change. Um, because of the of the changing way that services are provided, um, we don't have any formal remit within um, IJBs uh, unless it's around health the elements of their care at the moment. Uh, and but um, and I think um, the development of our voice um, makes our role change as well. I think it's uh, the future of the role of the Scottish Health Council. I think will have to change. Thanks very much, uh, convener. C can I just touch on another issue around the service change? Uh, looking, looking at the criteria you describe, I, I find it quite astonishing that in six years, from 2011 to October 2016, only six out of 27 changes have been deemed to be um, to be major. So, for example, the closure of, of CIC was deemed to be a, a minor a minor change. So, so, can you just clarify who ultimately makes the decision on whether it's a major change? Um, and of the six that that's been deemed as a major change. How many of those six have you had a different view to the health board or have you simply gone along with the health board's conclusion that it's a major change? Um, <clears throat> just to clarify, it is, it, it, the, the guidance is very clear that when boards wish to know if, if a proposal constitutes major service change, they should seek advice from the Scottish Government. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're asked to provide a view, um, uh, but that is not, it's not our decision on whether something is uh, seen as major service change or not. Um, if, in terms of your question, how often do we disagree with the board? Um, as you, as you yourself said, most service change is not deemed major, um, and quite often when something is major, it's fairly clear that it is major to everybody. Um, a couple of examples recently would be, uh, in terms of Greater Glasgow and Clyde, for example, where Greater Glasgow and Clyde had uh, uh, expressed their view in a board paper. Uh, that changes to maternity services and to Lightburn Hospital were not major, uh, and we took a different view. Um, it hasn't happened a lot because there isn't, by definition, there isn't a lot, hasn't been a lot of major service change. However, we have noticed more recently um, a, a, a larger extent of major service change, and we think that's probably a trend that will continue. So it's ultimately the government decides whether they refer a controversial decision to themselves. Is that, is that pretty much the case? Can, can I just... When something's been deemed um, 
to be a, a minor change. Um, can you just describe what your role is around um, supporting health boards in the consultation? Because there does seem to be a lot of criticism that actually, when it's a major change, you have a, ma you have a, you have a major role. When it comes to a minor change, you have a lot of very poor examples of consultation right across the board. If you, if you look at the article today in today's Times, I can give you some quotes from a number of people. Yvonne McClatchy of Dunfermline, who was opposed to the, the, the change in the cleft palate surgery, uh, being, being centralised in Glasgow, she said, the SHC is a chocolate fire guard. One public engagement meeting was arranged the day before a decision. They couldn't produce minutes or a record of answers from officials. I've complained to the health secretary uh, that they are hopeless. Catherine Hughes, a disabled patient who campaigned against the closure of the CIC bed, said uh, consultations were utterly useless and added the SHC is toothless, just a tick, tick box outfit which doesn't explore key points thoroughly. In the CIC engagement process, a patient panel was actually chaired by the official who proposed the cuts. Caroline Davidson, who was campaigning to save the children's ward from closure at the REH, um, said, our engagement process is a seriously flawed shambles with managers dominating and little information. So there's a lot of anger out there from patients and communities about the consultation process that takes place for a minor change. But what role do you actually have in terms of influence that consultation? So when it's not major is advisory so we will support the board and we will feed back to them um, uh, our findings and and for example in terms of the uh, engagement exercise around center for integrative care we did publicly feedback to the board uh, the views that had been given to us from participants um, but we're clear that ultimately the decision is, is belongs to the board um, and the one thing I'd also say add, add about that is that I accept that people, you know, people have given their views that they feel that the engagement process was not was not um, uh, as good as it should have been, and that's what they said to us. There was, however, a, um, certainly evidence that there was a very open and realistic discussion at the board where they were fully aware of the strength of feeling of the campaign groups. And if I can compare that with when when we first started, um, what what would be a much more common feature? would be that you'd get a very controversial proposal. Um, there could be lots of public controversy, there could be marches, lots of media. Uh, the proposal would go to the board, there'd be very little discussion. It would often get passed unanimously or fairly near unanimously. Um, what we saw with that particular proposal, the Centre for Integrative Care, is we saw a very open and lively discussion at the board. The chair of the board actually didn't support the proposal and supported the case that had been put by the campaigners. And I think that demonstrates that um, they were clearly aware of the issues and they were clearly aware of the strength of feeling. Um, but it's not our role to, if you like, replace the board's own governance and their own ability to make those decisions. It never has been. So we can't say to the boards they've made the wrong decision or that's not a decision they should take. That quite properly is the role of the board. Our role is to, in, is to help the boards go through an engagement process so that they are fully aware of all the issues when they make that decision. No time did I ask whether your role was about influencing a decision. It was about how you facilitate um, appropriate and proper engagement. Um, and the concerns and the quotes I read out were concerns over the engagement process itself. Um, ultimately, they'll have concerns over the final decision, but they've been very specific about concerns over the engagement process. So you're basically saying you're happy the way the health boards conduct the engagement yeah. process, you're not. No. Therefore, what influence do you actually have over that engagement process? And if you're unhappy, how public do you go in explaining your unhappiness over the consultation process? We did actually write formally to uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde and we put down some, we put in, the, in that letter the feedback that we'd received from people who'd been involved in that engagement process um, and drew that, drew that formally to their attention. We'd also had meetings with the board and that's quite normal and that would happen in other circumstances with, with other boards too. Basically health boards, in your opinion, health boards are carrying out consultation processes that are not in your opinion, frankly, up to scratch. Mm -hmm. But unlike a major change, you don't actually have a, a, a huge say in that consultation by the sounds of it. In most cases, they would take our, um, our views on board, even, if, even not, if not for that one, to, as learning for the future. But you're absolutely right. We don't have uh, a remit to intervene and stop boards engaging on uh, change which is not deemed to be major, or to be able to, if you like, give them orders in terms of how they do that. We don't have that remit. Uh, Maria, just just one second. I'll come to you in a minute. Um, are all your um, minutes discussions with government 
meet or uh, minutes of meetings with the government are they all public, publicly available, or do people have to FOI to get those? I, I think in the, in the spirit of openness with, the, with this committee, we're very happy to to, to share. No, um, that's, the no, that's not what I was asking. I'm saying are all your minutes and discussions with government, with health boards, etc., are they all publicly available? They, they, are they, they, in terms of being publicly available on a website or available readily, we want you to click on it. No, not everything is there, but in terms of transparency, if there are things that are missing from that, in terms of minutes of Scottish Health Council meetings, for instance, no, or no, other documentation, very council, happy to share no, with the committee. No health Council meetings. If you meet with Health Board A, B or C to discuss issue A, B or C, are the minutes from that published anywhere? Don't only publish those. Thank you. Um, Marie. Thank you, convener. Um, I would have to declare that I'm a health professional too, and I have to admit that as a health professional coming into politics, it's, um, it, it's been difficult for me to see um, how politically heated some of these um, discussions can be and how much of a political football the NHS can become. So um, I wonder, um, particularly thinking about difficult decisions where there are safety grounds for the change, how much um, weight should be given to what the public wants and how much weight should be given to what the clinicians are suggesting as a way forward. Opening well, remarks in that respect, um, convener, I, I think the important thing here and I think the lessons and the learning from our engagement with communities and patients is about the range of experts and voices and where that sits. Um, and traditionally, that, and I said at the very start, in terms of um, some of the comments I made, that uh, some of the process around service change can appear opaque, and when patients are engaged, it's further and further down the track, and therefore the, the level of the engagement can feel pretty minimal. So one of the key things, I think, is about uh, a much earlier and open engagement about um, safety, about the quality of care, of which safety is uh, a fundamental part. And I think some of the, the work that's been shared, so for instance, by the Chief Medical Officer um, around real estate medicine, around uh, the National Clinical Strategy, starts to have a more open conversation about what's the quality of healthcare and how do we deliver it in Scotland. But I guess just in my opening remarks on, in answering that question is, I think we need to have a, a different relationship between patients, experts and clinicians and I think one of the key things is making sure that that conversation is held at the start so there's a better understanding. And in that, I have to say as well, is there is an important issue of language and about how people can get lost in a very technical uh, and obscure language. And I think the important thing is not to be condescending or patronising how we engage with patients, but to actually be level with them about some of the challenges in delivering increasingly complex health care and the workforce challenges, for instance, within that. But, convener, if I may pass either Pam or Richard in terms of the particular balance between engagement around safety and patient care. Just to say, I mean, we... So, when we're looking at how boards are engaged with the public, the, the guidance was produced by the Scottish Government um, in 2010, and that, in fact, uses a phrase that has been used, that was used previously. In fact, it's had a, been in use probably for about 10 years or so, if not longer. And what it says is that it expects boards to give the views of patients and the public the same priority as it gives to clinical standards and financial performance. It does have one important proviso, though. It does say, unless there are exceptional grounds, e.g. safety. Um, and when we've had discussions with patients and the public about where they, how they feel that balance should work, do they feel it's the right balance? They feel it is. But they agree with the point that, actually, if there may be overriding issues around clinical safety, then that's clearly very important. Um, as Robbie has said, our, our view is that this, is, this, is the be this issue is best tackled by boards being open and honest with their communities and not appearing to prejudge issues um, or to use that as a way of saying, well, we're not going to engage. Um, and it's a tricky one, and we understand that this is sometimes quite difficult. Um, uh, we would also never stand in the way of a board making any changes that it felt if it had to make changes of a temporary nature to, in to ensure that services were safe. We would never want to say they shouldn't do that uh, without engagement. Um, we would want them to make whatever necessary urgent changes uh, they had to to ensure that services were safe. It is probably worth um, pointing out that, of course, the Scottish Health Council's role um, focuses around the engagement with the public 
um, whether or not the board has engaged with the public or does engage with the public, not necessarily or doesn't hasn't got the the remit to focus on those other elements, um, which may be um, a stumbling block in the process. Thank you. Um, can I ask also about um, your citizens' um, panels? Is that what you call them? Yes. Yeah. So I'm interested to know, um, just as a completely change of subject, I think some people touched on it before, I'm interested to know how people become a member of your citizen panel, so it's not randomly selected like a jury service would be. Who, who People still put themselves forward, I presume, for that role. Done this, so um, this is this is the first one um, that we've we've had, um, and I think in a way um, it is uh, semi-random, is it not, Richard? It's well, it's it's <laughs> it's random in the sense that people don't self-select for it. Um, so, as Pam has said, this was we did, we did, this is partly a test. It's quite innovative. Um, we initially used the electoral register to identify people, and we mailed them. We invited them to. Um, to join the panel. Um, we also, we, we were quite ambitious. We wanted to recruit 1,300 people across Scotland and that was quite important because we wanted a minimum of 30 in each integrated joint board area. <coughs> um, and, that, uh, and that was to ensure, that was one of the things that we wanted to do to make sure it was reasonably demographically representative of the people of Scotland. Um, so we also did recruitment um, by going, to, by basically going, you know, standing on the street or going to shops and so on. So we'd approach people and ask them, um, we, the result is that we've got uh, a makeup which is broadly representative. We did actually end up with more women and men, but in other respects, it's broadly representative. Um, I, we're now, we're now analysing the first set of results back from that. Um, it's random in the sense that, I suppose the important point was, is that we wanted it to be not people who, if you like, self-selected themselves and said we want to join it, but actually were people who were approached and therefore, um, in a sense, you know, they're, they're a panel of citizens as opposed to uh, uh, people who, who, who may be quite commonly get more involved in participation networks. Nothing wrong with uh, people who, who get involved, but it was very, we were very clear we wanted to get, if you like, we wanted to try and get that more representative of the people of Scotland. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Dana, thanks for coming along um, to talk to us. There was two or three things I wanted to, to kind of touch on. Um, and, and, and first of all, obviously, around about the role of the SHC, um, which is to monitor the health board's involvement of, of the public, as you described described at the start. Now, there's clearly a process there um, from health board minutes proposal. You've been involved in part of that engagement process um, and then moving on with a recommendation to government. Um, and first of all, I'd just like to say it's quite heartening to see specifically uh, on Lightburn, which I know something about being local to me, um, that you did play a role in that process in terms of redefining that as a major service change, which the health board clearly hadn't wanted to do, and they proposed that that was a minor originally, so it's quite heartening to see that. So I suppose my first question, just to set the scene, is are you comfortable with the, the overall flow of that process? And I suppose this is a leading question, but take it as you like, or would you be happier with government ministers intervening much earlier in the process, as has been called for um, uh, from other, other, other sides? Convener, if, if I may make some, some broad remarks and then hand to Pam and Richard in terms of Scottish Health Council role. I think the, the point that's been touched on earlier, which we will need to think about, about the process, is uh, <clears throat> in terms of the £13 billion that is spent on health and social care, £8 billion of that is sitting within the integration authorities. So a bit of redesign, rethinking is required in terms of us as... Um, Scottish Health Council, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, but Healthcare Improvement Scotland in the round, think about how then do we relate to a different world that is now emerging. And as we get to the end of life for this Parliament, the majority of the spend in health and social care budget, as intended and expressed by the Cabinet Secretary, will be within those integration authorities. So there is a bit of the journey here that we need to now think about in the context of service change and existing um, advice, support and guidance from the Scottish Health Council. But convener, in terms of the specifics, in terms of how the uh, works at present at hand to Pam and Richard. Shall I go first? Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose thinking about that one, I mean, I think there was an issue around exploring with with communities and with the board the, if you like, the some of the aspects around that change, so we could give that proper consideration. Um, could the government have called that in further, further you know, earlier in the processes they could? 
Um, uh, they, they, they chose not to. They were clear they wanted to follow that local process. Um, I would agree with Robbie. I think this is a good time to look again at how that process works. Um, for example, you know, the fact that we give, a, we give our own view. Um, when that first started, that was a fairly blunt, to be blunt, fairly informal process, and there wasn't really a lot of interest uh, in our view or how we arrived at it. And that's, we've seen that change. And I, understandably, I think because of the reasons why it is because it gets called in. So I think it's, I think it's helpful, I think, perhaps to think again, particularly in the light of integration, um, how that role should work. I would like to see people have more confidence in the local decision-making process so that it's not necessary to have a big discussion every time about whether it should be seen major or not. Um, and I'd like to get away, frankly, from that very, what I think is perhaps an overly simplistic division between major and non-major, because I think, as I say, it does have a very unfortunate message for people who's, who, who, who are being affected by some change, which is very important for them. It doesn't mean it's not important just because it's not major. I mean, that, that original, it was, if, when, when we first started, it was called significant service change, and they called it major because they felt that was bad to call it significant because it meant other change was insignificant. Um, so you can't really win uh, with the terminology. So I think looking again at how we have a, perhaps a better way of classifying change would be very helpful. I'd like to move on now and focus on the relationship um, between yourselves and the health board in terms of fulfilling that, that remit we talked about at the start. And as I mentioned, I've, uh, I'm aware of uh, the, the light burn situation um, and a lot of concerns um, have been raised with me by local groups about that engagement process because we're not yet on to the, the consultation process. Um, I mean, for example, the stakeholder reference group, there was a meeting where there was 13 members, there are seven of the members of that group were actually health board employees, including the chair. Um, the, um, the director of planning has gone to the media, we talk about politicising these things, the director of planning took a full page in the local newspaper to argue that the case that the health board was pushing forward. Um, the health board's public involvement manager told the stakeholder group that the board wasn't in a position to invest in the hospital, which kind of prejudges the... Uh, the process and the meetings themselves that were held were um, two were held on the same day, a location that was um, most of the community agreed was fairly inaccessible um, for the people that were affected by uh, by the change. And I actually turned up at one of those meetings and um, was uh, the health board tried to prevent me from speaking at the meeting, which was an interesting process. Um, but I, uh, as you can imagine, did uh, did make my views known at the meeting. So um, for a number of um, uh, examples there, where um, people would call it a question the engagement process specifically there and obviously we've heard that from other 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 parts um, from other other uh, issues as well um, I suppose the question is um, round about um, how you intervene that you've touched on that to some extent um, in, in terms of that process but also round about this fait accompli if we're still used, allowed to use fait accompli in a post Brexit world would it be a French phrase but um, in that in that in terms of that are we um, do you have any evidence or any data round about um, the uh, the number of of, uh, of uh, proposals that are changed through the consultation process, or is it by and large the, the, the reality that once the health board's made that decision, um, does that just kind of get carried through, or, or is there any data, as I say, on how what percentage of those are actually changed through the engagement in the consultation process? One of the issues which we regularly um find that we have to really push some of the health boards to consider is the option appraisal approach you know it isn't it shouldn't be this is it uh, there needs to be some some um, sharing and we would we would really like the public to be really engaged in developing those options because um, our view is that um, it's much more likely to have a successful process if the public are engaged. Um, and um, sometimes there is resistance to the option of proposal approach, and sometimes there isn't. Uh, and that may uh, reflect why sometimes you only get a small number of majors, because they may have already moved through that process, because perhaps they're working together in a better way. But on the other hand, uh, we do know that there is some resistance in some cases to uh, developing a full option appraisal. Just to add that, I mean, I suppose two points. One is before a board goes to a formal consultation, um, we will <coughs> we will monitor the quality of the board's engagement process, as Pam said, around the option appraisal process, for example, and the option development process, which are very important. 
Um, and if we don't feel that they've done sufficient work to go to a formal consultation, we will say so at that point, because um, we don't feel there's any benefit in boards going to a formal consultation if they haven't done sufficient work to prepare for that. Um, once they've come to the end of that consultation process, we will also then publish a formal report um, in which we'll describe what the board did and then also describe how we feel they've complied or not with the guidance. In practice, if we don't feel the board is doing as much as it should to demonstrate compliance with the guidance, we wouldn't, wouldn't want it to get to a point where we let that go to the end of the consultation. We'd want to step in and say to the board, we think you need to think, be more thoughtful about how you're approaching this. We've got some suggestions to make and we'd like to have a discussion with you. Um, and we'd hope then to have an agreement with the board in terms of a way forward. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, the time that we've got left, I've, I've listened quite intently to some of the answers that you've, you've given. Can you can you really honestly tell me how relevant the the you know the SHC is? Your rem your remit is to monitor health boards and how they carry out, and, uh, you know what they do for for patients and how they carry out their functions. Should your remit your role be actually increased? Um, do you believe that um, now with all the changes that uh, Richard Norris has said has come along in the last couple of years, that you should be given more teeth? Because quite honestly, from where I'm sitting, I don't think you've any. I don't think there's any doubt that the, that the role of the council probably does need to change. Um, I, I find, I find um, quite an element of frustration mm. Um, at times that um, there isn't wider awareness of what the Health Council is. Even its name is a little bit confusing. Um, and so there are, there are a lot of factors which I think have actually stacked up. So I think there is a need for change. Whether or not it's teeth or whether or not it's, um, whether or not there's a, there needs to be some separation of different aspects of the role, that I think is an issue which we will need to consider. One of the problems I have locally in my area, uh, NHS Lanarkshire, is I don't believe that they, they, they get across to the public what they're doing correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And basically they don't uh, publicise it enough. And yes. with the greatest respect to Ivan McKee, I've also attended meetings where I'm just totally aghast at what, what, you know, what they were doing. Um, but basically, you know, how how do you sit down with boards like this and try and entice them to either change their views, mm -hmm. look at what they're doing, and some I have to point out that some of the things that they are doing uh, are correct because we have to change. It's mm -hmm. a it's a new world out there. Things have changed since the mm -hmm. 19, you know, since the NHS was first set up nearly 70 odd year ago. Um, you know, and we have to look at the, the, the revamp and, and, and redress and, and time. And I have to say, I also agree with my colleague, Marie Todd, that I hate the NHS getting used as a political football mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, we should all work together. We've got one of the best health service in the world, mm -hmm. in the world, and we continually kick it. Mm -hmm. So what would you do to sit down with NHS boards to try and get them to get the view out there better, because I think they ain't doing it. I think, this, um, I think this is something which we are extremely aware of. Um, and, and you can see from their perspective that uh, there's, uh, they would see us, they might see us rather, um, as um, not really being part of it, not necessarily knowing exactly what's going on. And from that perspective, um, I think that's quite a useful uh, bit because we're, we, we tend to be more like the public in that perspective because if they can't convince us, then they haven't got a hope of, of convincing the public. Um, and um, so I think there is, uh, I think there's, uh, one of the things that we do constantly try to do is to, in, in, is to work with boards to make them more effective about engaging, engaging with the public. And recently, there have been some boards who have um, recognised the importance of doing that and have made significant progress. But these are isolated; these are isolated approaches. I would like it much broader across the piece. My last question is: 
how can you get across to the public that you exist? <laughs> I think, uh, think, I think that's absolutely right, and I think it's one of the things that we hope we will be able to address. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Can, can I say, I, I'm sensing a lot of frustration here with, with committee members, and, and I certainly have that. I'm looking here. The Scottish Health Council has a budget of £2.3 million, it's, and, and it's looking for extra funding from, for the Scottish, from the Scottish Government, when, uh, according to the, uh, the accounts. Um, and over the last two two years, it has engaged with, according to your own accounts, 1,180 people in two years. I am really struggling. You've got 14 offices, 14 offices, and you've managed to contact just over 1,000 people and engage with them in two years with a budget of 2.3 million. I'm failing to see what we get for our money. And I think Richard's absolutely right. I think you're a toothless hamster. I really do. I think I, I don't see where you're adding value in this, and I think this needs a major overhaul of some kind if we're going to genuinely have some sort of uh, uh, transparency processes that patients and the public genuinely engage in, because at the moment we do not. We absolutely do not, in my experience, having been an elected representative since 2003. So um, I think there's a lot of people frustrated in this room. The committee will um, have a discussion afterwards on the evidence that, we, that we've had. Can I ask about your review? What's the timescale for the review of this? I'm, in I'm anticipating we will be able to uh, publish the review in February. Is there still time to submit to that review? I am more than happy to take your comments. OK, thank you. OK, thank you for your uh, attendance this morning and we'll suspend briefly for a change of panel. Thank you.
the third item uh, on the agenda is an evidence session with Sports Scotland. Uh, welcome to the committee, Stuart Harris, Chief Executive, and Mel Young, the Chair. Could I invite you to make a, an opening statement, gentlemen? Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us along and uh, very keen to give evidence uh, today, this morning. Um, I mean, um, from our perspective, uh, trying to put it into a kind of overall uh, uh, scheme of things globally, um, I think sport in the world now is starting to be recognised um, in the key uh, inputs it can have in, ter in terms of the wider population, not just about uh, winning medals. I myself um, uh, uh, I travel around the world a lot in, in the connection with sport in this area. And um, particularly lately, governments around the world are starting to recognise the impact that sport can have in these wider agendas, socially, in terms of health, etc., etc., in terms of the wider community. Um, and I've certainly seen with, with previous work that I've been doing, not connected with sports, gone around the Homeless World Cup, for example, where sport, you're making an intervention with the most marginalised people on the planet and actually changing their lives as a result of that sport. And so there's many, many other examples of how you use sport in different um, areas to, to create that change. Um, and we in Sport Scotland have actually now created a system which is connected together, so using, to, using the high performance with the community connected into one overall system to make an impact uh, uh, to create change. So, when, when I'm uh, around in other countries in the world and talking about Scotland, governments and others are really interested because they're saying, look, Scotland, you appear to be ahead of the curve. I think we are quite definitely ahead of the curve in terms of the way we have this integrated system here in, in Scotland. Something to be really, really proud of. Something, in fact, I think we can, we can, we can grow on. So that, so that sitting here today is really interesting because sport is part of that Active Scotland. And what, what Active Scotland has, I think, as, as a policy, again, is, 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 is innovative and world-leading. And sport has a critical role to play in that. It obviously cannot, on its own, sort out all the challenges that we have in, 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 in health across Scotland. But it can work with, 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 in other areas. And I think there's plenty of examples of where that can happen, but we need to be better at that. So sport, very, very happy to be sitting here having this discussion to give evidence today um, and uh, delighted to, to, to answer your questions. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, the committee is looking at participation in sport. What's, um, you know, in your view, is the main barrier to participation in sport? Well, what we've, what we've tried to put in place is a system which breaks down those barriers. So there's a degree of universality about that. So we've got a foothold in every school uh, in the country. So we give every young person an opportunity to try activity, sport, physical education, and begin to join that up with, um, with what's happening in the community. It's really important when you look at a, any system where you've got schools, and you, schools connected to community, to performance, driven by people and facilities. And for our, from our perspective, we're beginning to build that capacity across the country. However, we have to continue to build that capacity. So we need more people involved. We'll continue to look at how we access more facility time um, in every authority across, across the country. So lots of progress being made, lots to do, but the system approach, we think, is often greater value than a funding stream project-based approach, which has probably been a thing of the past. In, in terms of that universality, you don't target areas of multiple deprivation? We've tried, to, we've tried to take a view that if we targeted every school in the country, um, that would give us an input to each of those schools. And probably if you have a system, I think you've got more opportunity then to target. So what we'll do going forward is we'll work with local partners. Um, we're quite keen to, to touch up against the attainment challenge authorities to look at how we get closer to education in some of those authorities to look at how we contribute to that attainment agenda, but also offer more and better opportunities for people in every community across the country. So but that universal is there for purpose. But you don't, you don't, you don't target at the moment? Uh, well, in the schools, in the schools area, we, we, we've gone for every single school. So you don't target? It, in, that, in that instance, no. Right. It's well, every in, school. In terms of the active schools um, programme, what evaluation has been done of that? We have uh, an annual evaluation we work what independent evaluation has been done of that? Uh, each, each coordinator works with, um, contributes towards gathering data. So all of the data is sent in and, contribute, and contributed 
centrally, nationally, so each school, each coordinator has a job to bring forward all of the data from their school, so we have data from every single school. Uh, and equally, we've also got, from time to time, independent evaluation of how we're getting on. So over the last four or five years, there's been a huge amount of progress in how we've built the numbers and access for children across the country. And who carried out that independent evaluation and has it been published? Uh, they've all been published. Um, I can't remember the last contributor, um, but they've all been published. Can you provide the committee with it? Yeah, we can that do that. We can Thank provide you. you with as much uh, detail. Colin. Can... I just touch on the issue of, of universality you mentioned there. Would it be fair, based on your comments earlier, to say that you think it's important, uh, an important role of, of Sports Scotland to increase participation in sport from those who are A, currently inactive, and B, also those who come from the least wealthy areas, given that the lower level of participation in sport amongst those in, in more deprived areas? Yep, I think that, that is our role. Um, we have a strategic role across across the country to look at how we bring partners together across and creating physical activity strategies. Um, so we're looking at how we bring partners from health, from the local government, from the trust, everyone locally who can contribute to people being active um, across, across the piece. The aim would be to have that strategic physical activity strategy looking at play, dance, sport and recreation, active living, and for us to be a part of that that solution locally. So our contribution will be to add value to local resources, local uh, focus uh, in school sport, in club, in, in leisure and recreation. Um, so from our perspective, both a strategic role and a contributory role to make sure that we add value to each local community going forward. But, but, but just looking at the two groups I mentioned, you don't actually measure activity levels amongst the projects that you should support based on that criteria. You measure activity levels based on sex, for example, you measure it based on age, but you don't actually measure the fact that, that, that someone's particular background or whether or not they were, when they come to an event, were inactive before they actually came to an event. So you can't distinguish whether or not little Johnny's coming along to four events a week instead of three and he's already active because you don't actually measure that at the moment. I think the, 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 the recent BBC documentary on, on, on Meadow Myth concluded the fact that participation in your, your performance sports programme, nine out of ten participants went to a private school uh, or a school in a wealthy area, but you don't actually measure that at the moment. So, so why don't you measure that at the moment? Why did they have to do their own research to get that information? If it's such an important thing to increase activity from people that are inactive and to increase activity from people from deprived areas? Well, we, th we think from, from our perspective in building that system, if you have an impact and a contribution to every single school in the country, we believe there's the opportunity and we're, we're too small to do it alone. We fundamentally work in partnership uh, across all of those areas. So our aim and aspiration is to have more and better opportunities. You're correct. We haven't managed to touch everyone as yet, but we want to create more and better opportunities. I would prefer to look at the information in a slightly different way in as much as two thirds of, of the more talented uh, individuals that are involved in, in sport at that top end come from state schools. We aspire to improve that. We aspire to give everyone the opportunity. We measure absolutely everything that we do in terms of intervention. Um, every single school submits data. Every single community sport hub submits data. And what we're seeing is growth in all of those areas. These are big samples. These are, in, in, in the schools arena, we're talking about nearly 300,000 young people. In the community sport hubs, we're over 100,000 people in This is not a small measurement sample. So we believe that we are beginning to tackle that with partners. We have to improve the measurement to try and look at how we can specifically say if there are inactive people uh, uh, beginning to be more active. And only recently we've, we've, we've started to have a look locally in the east end of Glasgow where we ourselves, Clyde Gateway, the NHS, Glasgow Life, um, are beginning to look at how collectively we can look at how we all work together to get people more active, from just simply leaving the house to taking some exercise at maybe a local sports centre. So whilst there are general measures of how we're taking things forward, we accept we have to look a bit more closely as partners at how we are, are more specific about that trans translation. Uh, Donald. Can I just ask about the, the budget, um, the budget proposals? Um, I think it's fair to say that 
the total sport budget um, for the coming year, 2017 to 18, is down in cash terms uh, by 7% and 8.3% in real terms. Uh, and I accept that doesn't, that's the sport budget, it's not the Sport Scotland budget. But could you um, tell the committee what implica implications uh, you feel that might have? Yes, I mean, for, from my point of view, it has quite serious implications at that level um, in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, we're building this system it, 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 and it's developing and we're, we're getting more people involved. So therefore, the implications for that are quite serious. But we also have a, a, another hit as well because uh, lottery receipts are going down. So in, in addition to that uh, reduction, we have a lottery reduction as well, which will uh, further impact us. So taking those two together is very serious level of, of, of cuts that will have to be made. And I think there's three areas, probably what one is, is, is into the uh, sports themselves, potentially. Second one is a t to the number of people involved, there's over a thousand people connected in some way with the, the, the funding that, that, that we do. And then thirdly is within, within Sports Scotland um, uh, organisation itself, there will have to be some kind of serious thing, possibly uh, 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 redundancies even. Um, we don't want to go down that route. Um, the, the overall budget uh, component uh, for sport in Scotland is just 0.14%. And out of that investment from the, the, the Scottish Government makes you getting massive impact. If the strategy going forward is about getting health, uh, Scotland to be a healthy nation, to become active, actually the last thing you should be doing is cutting the sports budget. Um, so it, it presents us real challenges for us, these, these cut, but two of them coming together, particularly significant challenges. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Um, we will take a prioritisation approach, though. So whilst we, uh, what I've said about having a system, we absolutely passionately believe in that system of school to community to performance, people and facilities underpinning that, we will have to hit performance sport quite hard this time round um, because the priority for us will be around community uh, given opportunities across the nation. So rather than just taking a salami slicing approach, we're taking a brave approach, in my opinion, which says here are the things that we think we must prioritise uh, and the choices that we make will be in that, that area. We will try and keep a balance so that we don't break the system completely. But for me, that prioritisation approach is vitally important. You can't just take lumps out of a system and hope that it will continue to deliver, both in engagement and participation terms, but also in success from a medals perspective. Both are equally valuable, but in this instance, we will have to prioritise community. Um, yeah, thank you, Convener. Just following on from that, do you have any concerns that that could perhaps break that performance system completely? Um, we will be measured, as measured as we can, uh, about, about, about taking that forward, but you probably saw uh, UK uh, level, um, one or two sports have been completely taken out of the funding system, um, investment system. So therefore, we will try and avoid that and make sure that we do not um, break any particular sport. Um, but we'll have to be very specific with each sport to make sure that they're clear on what their targets are, what their ambitions are, what they will try and achieve, both in supporting community development and also performance. Uh, so. It's not the ideal thing to try, to be honest. Um, and we're, as Mel had said earlier on, this double whammy around lottery is quite worrying, quite challenging. But for me, we'll continue to talk with the government about how we take this forward because the belief in the system is vitally important. We see this as something that is unique to Scotland, is important to Scotland, and gives us a better chance of actually achieving the twin goals that we've got around performance and participation. I mean, it feels like a sort of surprising conversation to be having, you know, um, a couple of years after the Commonwealth Games when we've heard a lot about legacy. How would you assess the active legacy of the Games and, you know, are, are you concerned about that legacy in terms of funding? I'll give, I'll give you a specific first up. Um, our legacy commitment from um, the Commonwealth Games, specifically with partners, was around community sport hubs. And we deliberately focused on, on that. So the target was 150 community sport hubs. We now have 157. Um, we will continue to prioritise that. There's almost, I think I mentioned earlier on, there's almost over 100,000 people now involved in community sport hubs. We were bringing communities together, bringing sports and activities together to make them more sustainable, 
and offer them a chance to do more things for themselves. Um, so that will be one of the key priorities for me, uh, hence the reason looking at when you're building any system, the twin goals of participation and performance are, are, um, are both important. But for me, we have to protect that system which looks at giving people locally opportunities to participate for whatever reason they want to participate. Now, that particular strategy was done deliberately. We could have been, we could have, as Sports Scotland said, there's lots of different things that we could, we could focus on, but we focused on one infrastructure project across all 32 authorities, and I think it's been a, been a success. All of our partners can probably report similarly on what their plans were locally in building a legacy. In terms of priorities and targeting, I note that the um, percentage of, there's been a fall in physical activity amongst children um, since, uh, a 3.9% fall since the Commonwealth Games, which seems quite surprising, and more notably amongst girls. Do you take, when you see these figures, when you have the results, do you step in there and take action to try and address that? Yes, we do. Um, again, I'll give you a specific. We work with each local authority on active schools, for example, where at the moment the breakdown in, the breakdown in gender is 52, 48, 52 in boys, 48 in girls. Um, we want to try and continue to, to, to improve that. But with each local authority, when they produce their results every year, we don't wait on other measures to tell us there's an issue. We actually just focus on what's happening locally. So in all 32 authorities, we take a very specific, customised approach and how we then sit down with that authority and say, how do we address that? Uh, whether there's, there's been gaps in staffing, whether there's some issue with, with schools, there's been, there will always be some, some changes. We can't always go on that upward trajectory. Sometimes it plateaus, sometimes it'll dip. But for me, we take that action regardless on an annual basis with each of the local authorities we work with mm -hmm. in terms of active schools, community sport hubs, and what other help we give them with participation uh, locally. Convener, may I ask a final question? Um, thank you. Um, you know, the activity guidelines for children, 60 minutes per day, I would suggest, and I'm sure others would agree that that is in no way <coughs> sufficient anyway. And I just wonder, you were talking about an all systems approach and clearly we're the health and sport committee and we will be, you know, suggesting that an active Scotland is a, is a healthier, you know, it's, it's, it's a well Scotland. In terms of engaging with other portfolio areas, you might be aware that the government, for example, are only spending 1.6% of a massive transport budget on walking and cycling. Now, uh, you know, coaches amongst us will, you know, I, I think there's general agreement that physical literacy perhaps isn't what it used to be. Children aren't out and about in the neighbourhoods and for various reasons they're not able to cycle and walk as safely. Are you engaging with government and asking that things like investment in walking and cycling be looked at as part of a physical activity strategy? Uh, yes, we are. Um, from our perspective, Mel touched on it just briefly. In our view, the Active Scotland framework, the Active Scotland policy, is world leading. However, it does need every contributor around the table, sport being one, education, health, transport, planning. Ultimately, we all have a responsibility to play and a, a job and to contribute to that active Scotland policy. For me, we still have to get better, both nationally and locally, at how we partner, how we are then held to account by ministers, by, you know, by, by government, by committees. Because for I, from, my, from my perspective, it's that partnership, it's that agreement about what we're going to try and achieve, just as you expressed it, and then how do we each play a role in that that will change population behaviour. So to make the nation more active, we're all going to have to contribute. It can't just be sport. Uh, you and I have had this conversation before. It can't just be sport. We're too small. But we can play both a strategic role in motivating and coordinating people going forward, but also our own specific role. But it needs that coordination at both levels. We think it's better recently locally because we've just grabbed that national, that, that role, that leadership role locally, where we're bringing partners together, setting the strategy, and making sure everyone has a role to play in delivering against that. So we need to improve that. Um, both nationally and still improve locally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, yes. Supplement, supplement to that. Yes, I, I, very much, I mean, I'm relatively new into the, this job in, as the chair, and, and one of the things that's quite clear is that, is that government's working in silos, so coming together around this, is, I think, is absolutely vital. Stuart says, if I can just share an anecdotal example for you from another country. 
in, in, in Brazil, in Rio, all their bus shelters are mini gyms. So that uh, what you see in the morning, oddly, is people in suits uh, doing pull-ups on, 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 on uh, uh, bus shelters and, and, and then children later on doing step-ups, etc. And um, then uh, later on, you'll kind of see that the, there's races in between the, the bus shelters that, that, that kids get involved in doing. And so that's an example, I think, of, of, of just thinking out the box slightly. Um, it might be, a, 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 you know, a applicable here. I don't know. But obviously the transport and the planning have come together and then sports. So sports provided the role of let's create a race around this. It's thing, it, that's the way we need to think and then work together and come up with these things. And that's how you'll increase activity by being smart about this. Uh, yeah, Tom, sorry. Just to follow on, and good morning, panel, from uh, Alison Johnson's point. Um, the health service showed that in the over-75 group, there was, between 2014 and 2015, an 18.5% increase in physical activity levels. Now, this is obviously very welcome news, particularly given that the 75-plus group is the, the least active. I wonder if you could perhaps explain and suggest what accounts for this rise? Is this a, a result? games legacy, increased investment, and how we uh, build upon this progress? Um, I certainly wouldn't put it down as a, as a games legacy. I think there's a greater degree of awareness amongst the older population about the health benefits of, of activity. I think my assessment is that there are more coordinated opportunities locally now. Um, an example from our perspective about our contribution is when you have a community sport hub, we can have cycling clubs, walking clubs, swimming, whatever you like, we can connect it to that. In fact, maybe a, a community sport hub should be a community hub, full stop. Um, so we think there are lots of more opportunities. We need to get better collectively as society at showing people where these opportunities are. Um, and that's the, the job of local agencies helped with ourselves and, and others. So I, I think there's a greater degree of awareness of health benefits of physical activity. Plus there's more and more group social opportunities such as jogging clubs, cycling groups, community sport hubs that I think are helping contribute to that. Mm. But when I said games legacy, I, I was struck the percentages that I have in front of me in 2012, 25, 2013, 26, 2014, 26, 2015, 31. So perhaps the games legacy wasn't the correct term, but perhaps inspired by the games, do you think it had any impact in increasing awareness of the benefits? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that's probably from from my perspective. Uh, we often get asked this question. You know, what's the inspiration effect? Uh, inspiration requires action, though. So whenever a young person or even someone my age or older uh, gets inspired, wants to do something, you have to then know where to go and what to do. Uh, and for me, socially, there's there's an acceptance and a camaraderie around that that then allows someone to stick at that activity. Yeah. And for me, I just think the awareness message is as high as it's ever been for me. Um, so whether it be older people looking at the health benefits, quality of life, extension of life, mitigating against chronic illness and disease, um, a mitigation uh, for that, or young people running about daft at school or at home, uh, and then actually beginning to get into some more formal formal sport and activity at the right time for them. So I think the awareness level is much better. The system approach, I think, is in good shape. We continue to get good uh, feedback from partners in other countries. We look at it um, and think that we've got a really good product here, but we have to make sure it continues to be in place and continues to develop and evolve. It doesn't take a huge amount of money. Uh, we're not asking for a huge amount of money, but what, what we have here is something that's working pretty well that we must try and protect to achieve those two outcomes at whatever age you are of um, uh, people being active and engaged and also progression. How do they get better at something? Yeah, Marie. Thank you, convener. Um, I represent the Highlands and Islands region and um, as well as some of the other barriers that folk face in terms of getting involved in space in sport, there's obviously the uh, issue of geography to tackle in the region that I represent. And in terms of competitive sport, much of it happens down here in the central belt. Um, kids, I mean, my own kids have got up in the middle of the night on a Saturday night to travel down on a bus to perform, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> in some sort of competition that starts at nine o'clock in, in Glasgow on a Sunday morning. Um, 
what are your aspirations for um, encouraging participation from the whole of the country? I know that the islanders face a, face a particular challenge in terms of expense, in, in terms of participation. Um, yep, really good question. I'm, I'm just, just up in Orkney at the weekend um, at their sports awards. Uh, great social gathering, great celebration of all things that are good. A couple of answers to your question. One, we're trying to build infrastructure on the island. I'll just focus on the islands for a minute and then we can come back into maybe some of the rural questions. Build some capacity and some infrastructure on the islands, both in terms of facility, uh, access and expertise. So we have, over the last 10 to 12 years, I would probably say, I've been really c committed to all 32 authorities, to be fair, but we've specifically looked at the island communities as having a real challenge. We have had some discussion recently can, uh, can with I the ask islands. Where you yeah. focused your attention? Is it mainly the Northern Isles or uh, all over? All over. Uh, well, the, the main focus for us has been Shetland, Orkney, and the Western Isles. We, re we recognise there are other island communities. There's more islands. Yeah, yeah, than yeah, yeah. There are islands. <laughs> There are other islands there, but that all, to be fair, that will all come in under that local authority. So in Argyll and Butte, we will cover the islands there through their strategy. Um, so we, we don't hopefully exclude anyone. Thank so you. building that capacity in local communities, we think is vitally important. Um, we have, from our, our perspective, looked at ways in which we can help talented athletes or those on that performance pathway with that transport um, to competition off, off the islands or from deeply rural, rural areas. We, we require the help of ferry companies, you know, it, the, the air services, all of that is, is, is part of that solution. So again, that integrated approach is, is really important. We have had some discussion with, with, with the island authorities about clubs and, and schools coming off the island, but that's a bit more challenging because the affordability of that would be quite difficult. Um, uh, across the piece. So we think we've done a good job in helping understand what the needs of the communities are. And for those on that talent pathway, we just, we're just putting another tranche of, of support in place that will help probably 60 athletes, not just from, that, from the islands, but from Highland as well, to kind of get to those training sessions at that level will help them take them to the, the next level. So we're well aware of those, those needs uh, locally. Thanks, and c can I follow on from that? Yeah. Um, just in terms of the accessibility of sp sponsorship and funding to, to all. So um, in the village where I live in Strathpeffer, there's massive, cycling's huge, you know, mountain, brilliant, easy access to good mountain biking facilities. And there's a couple of young lads in the village who have taken that to a next level and both are competing um, it, at a very high level in cycling, in both nationally and internationally, one of them. Now, one of them has a disability, and it's much harder for him to access funding and sponsorship than it is for the, for the other lad in terms of making progress to that elite level. And I know the news story yesterday about the female boxer, you know, the, the, it was all over the news last night about this promotion guy who's been, again, women doing that type of sport for his whole life, but is now won round by that lassie. So I think it's difficult for women to gain funding and my daughter was a brilliant footballer but she'll never manage to make a living at it so what are you doing to tackle that type of um, issue I, I, I mean if I, I could say broadly we obviously want to support as many athletes as possible I mean the qualities is the kind of the heart of what we're doing in terms of sport I mean uh, in a more general sense you can have a look at what's happened with the Paralympics and um, how that's uh, inspired people uh, not only to get involved but probably in the wider society uh, made the issue of disability you know, more inclusive. Um, I do think, however, on the, on the issue of sponsorship, um, that it, it, it's really poor in Scotland, the, the, the level of private sector support that comes in. If you, if you compare it to other countries, it's, it's way behind. And I kind of think that we are doing really well with sport and there's more we can do, not just the community, but the high, high level supporting athletes. And, uh, and the sponsorship levels and support from the private sectors is really poor. And that is something I think we, we will want to have a look at to see how that we can do this, because there seems to be a view, oh, well, the government just does all of this when, of course, it, it can't. So having the private sector come to the table, I think, would, would, would help enormously. I don't know about the specific cases of what you're doing, but for us from Sport, on Sports Scotland side, we would certainly want to support the, the, the two people that you're talking about and do so in the best way that we can. 
In some cases, it probably depends a little bit on the standard in that event as well, because there is a bit of a cutoff. Once you reach a particular standard, it does unlock more resources and more help from the system. So whether yeah, it be, I think, I think yeah. one of the challenges is that he started out as a mountain biker and that that yep. isn't a Paralympian event. So he's having to convert to a different kind of cycling. Yeah, and you know that that is. I had a conversation with a young lad uh, who has actually got some significant disabilities, but he boxes, uh, and there is no obviously outlet for that. But he still wants to box, so we can help where we can with those local opportunities and try and improve the coaching in the club to help him specifically. But it's there is no Olympic or Paralympic outlet outlet for. Well, but he, I mean, he's in a yeah. coaching. Group. Yeah. He's, his coach is based in Manchester, but he still has to trek on the train with yeah. his bike down there. <laughs> yeah. Which is tricky. Mm. Uh, thank you for being there. What I wanted to specifically ask about was with regards to the school estate and primary schools specifically. Um, from my experience, I don't think we're really u utilising the primary school estate for sport. And I'm just interested, interested to hear your comments on that and how you think um, post-school hours we can have more sport within primary schools. Um, because certainly when I've been doing different visits, often when the school day finishes, these buildings are locked up. And I think we're missing a great opportunity to actually try to utilise them more. Yeah. Well, I'll probably start with giving a bit of an aspiration of mine that, that the schools become community hubs. <coughs> and they become a focus for sport, for other activities, uh, in a very programmed way, making sure it's very clear just where the opportunities are and that people can, can, can get into those. We did a study a few years back which showed that the school estate was 95% available. So that means, uh, in terms of definition, there's someone there to look after the building and to open and close it, look at health and safety. But it's only 55 to 60% accessed. So. How are we taking that forward? In our discussions with every single local authority, we're looking at how they build the capacity and access to facilities. The only way we're going to increase participation or engagement is to increase the capacity and availability of space. Um, often, uh, and this is it's not a competition, but often there's a focus on, on coaching and volunteering, and that's rightly, rightly correct, but it has to go hand in hand with facilities, space, and programming so that we can make the most of those spaces and have places where coaches can coach and volunteers can can work with, with, with those groups. So our aspiration would be to have, and we can't be silly about this because there's a cost attached to it, but the bottom line we would like to get a programmed approach with each local authority which maximises the space that they have available and particularly the use of schools because they are deep in communities, they sit in what I think are really good spaces for, for community activity and engagement and f for me that, that will probably be one of the biggest factors in, in developing and sustaining participation in the future. Local communities, local spaces, local uh, uptake. See, if I can just yeah, add to that point. I mean, I think one of the things that where we're going with this generally in sport in Scotland, what we've got to do within this general overall framework, it's about a culture change. And this is just part of it. And all these questions that you're asking are all connected to this. So in the past, people have just said, well, it's the school, so it's the school. And when it shuts, it shuts, and then we go away. To get people to think, just the general population and, and us, that actually that school uh, asset is there and we can use it requires a change, and it takes time, but, it, but it's slowly happening. And I think that across the board, that's what we're trying to do with sport here, to get people to be at all ages and all levels and wherever they're from, to just automatically get into sport and, and play it and get involved at wherever it can be. And that's what we're desperately trying to do. Of the 157 community sport hubs, 60% are in schools, and we think that's great. We, we need more, um, but that's a good start. So what's the plan to make that happen? The plan for us is to and at a time At a time when local government is having its budgets shredded how, how are you going to make that happen yeah well we'll continue to work with each local authority to look at their estate we'll look at uh, probably there's a, a model which community sport hubs enshrines which does i think give the community more responsible responsibility for running their own affairs and running their own programs so rather than everything being delivered by professional staff for me there is an economy which is very clear about giving communities some power giving them the responsibility to work around and manage some of those facilities themselves 
Uh, and that's the way that we're taking things forward. So it seems to me that there could be a, a very positive mixed economy in Scottish communities. In every local authority, I don't see any, any reason why it could be in every local authority, where there's an element of programmed and delivered activity through professional sources and also community-driven facilities, uh, uh, programs, clubs, community sport hubs, where they are doing a lot of the staffing themselves around their own clubs, which is what people do around clubs anyway. But what I'm asking is, is that going to be running magic beans? Where's the money to make these things happen? Because one of the, what, you know, just to put in the picture, the, um, being the convener of the committee, I get contacted by a lot of people, I've been contacted by a lot of people about this, and they don't buy some, a, a number of them, and I would say fairly significant and influential people, don't buy the model that you're promoting, the club model. They say it's exclusive that it prevents people from accessing on the basis of cost and that cost is the biggest barrier to participation. And the, they charge Sports Scotland with being elitist and bureaucratic and not being a grassroots um, organisation that's in touch with communities, particularly communities that are the most deprived. And they keep repeating that cost is the biggest barrier. And yet I've barely heard you mention cost this morning. So where's the money coming from to allow people in the most deprived communities to access sport and for fitness, well-being, and who knows what they might go on to. I don't particularly, I'm not particularly interested whether they become world champions. I just want people to be active and engaged and I don't see where the money's coming from for your model. Well, I mean, uh, it's interesting your comments, we'll take those on board. If, if any of those people want to come and talk to us, we're happy to do that. A um, number of them said they have. Um, but, and we can... I will direct them to you. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for that. Um, what we what we will do what we do with our resources is is work locally to get the best possible local plan uh, with the resources that are available. I take your point about the, the availability of resources. Our, from our perspective, and we've used this statistic a number of times. Ninety five percent of the budget for sport in Scotland, ninety percent sorry, is locally based. So therefore. There's a huge reliance on, on what's happening locally. Sport Scotland is 10% of that total budget. Um, so the resources we have available we, locally, we have to prioritise as much as we can. But the system we have now, I think, allows us to prioritise and target, and we will target those communities. Alex? So, can, can I yeah. just add, add to that? You know, I really take on, on, on your point. Um, you know, look, there's a triple whammy, if you like. We mentioned our cuts, then the lottery, and, that, and then you've got local authority cuts. So there is a real issue about the amount of money that's available in sport. And what happens, of course, the local authorities, um, they have issues about keeping prices low so that people can get involved or, or, or getting income in. And it's a real challenge across. We, we would want to get to a system where everybody um, can participate in some level. So the issue about lack of funding in the sports system, be it in local authorities or us, is a real challenge. You're absolutely right about that, and that's something we have to address. If, if, if I was sitting in government, to be quite honest, I'd be, doubling the, I'd be doubling the sports budget. I'd be, I'd be putting more uh, resources into sport because long term, it's going to have a, a, a better effect for, the, uh, for, for society as a whole. That's what I'm doing. I'll be looking at the resources. I'd also be looking at how we can do this in a much smarter way. So I know from other work that I've done, that in, in point of fact, some of the resources you require on the grassroots to get people involved isn't particularly expensive. Actually, in some cases, all you need is a ball and some volunteers and some creative thinking. So we need to think about that in a smart way, about at grassroots level, how we can do more, in particular in the most poor areas. And I think we have ideas and ways in which we can do that. I, I don't buy the fact that, that Sports Scotland is an elitist um, bureaucratic organisation at all. We, we are responsible for administrating public money, so we have to have uh, systems that are clear and, and, and robust. But basically, we are providing the catalyst for others to, to, to work in, 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 in the wider community. That's why we're doing what we're doing. It's a very, very important part, I believe, of the fabric of society sport. So we should be investing in it. That's, that's the answer to your question. So, so invest so in it. Just to be clear, you've said finance is a, will increase participation. Therefore, on an, for, for an individual, the same applies, that their ability to access sport is there's a strong correlation to their ability to pay for that access. 
I would believe so. Yes. Thank you. In 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 where we where, I mean you can. What I'm trying to say is you can do sport anyway. You can do it out in the park there, for example, quite easily. It won't cost co cost you anything. But we're living in in a society now where. Uh, uh, as you know, a lot of people will hark back to the days that we used to just play in the street. Well, that doesn't, society doesn't work like that anymore. We have to have facilities and places where people can go, and that's where the barriers are, and how you get there, how you transport there, and the cost of being there. So that's what we have to look at in, 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 in the poor, com poorest communities, where people who don't have finance and how they can access these facilities. That's the challenge. Um, okay. but, but sport will provide answers in that, that's if we can do that. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I'd just like to ask one question about the uh, culture of elitism in sport acting as a barrier to inclusivity. And this goes, to my mind, right back to you know, early days of primary school, when, if I remember my own experience, um, very early on, P1, P2, uh, we were sorted almost by peer review into those that could play football and those that really couldn't. You were picked last often if you were in the second group and, and not so much in the first group. And then that became a received wisdom as you went through the school ranks. And that I, I sort of found a school report just on the weekend, which talked about my lack of interest in football. I didn't have a lack of interest in football. It was just perceived that I wasn't very good at it. It was probably true. But, um, but nevertheless, I, did, I was interested. But the, t the PE teacher realised that I'd missed that bar. And as a result, you know, it was only in adult life that I found sports that I was good at and interested in and... and got active through um this is a this is a massive barrier to to kids and i think it goes right up to the you know where the weight of investment is in terms of investment is is targeted largely at the elite athletes who are competing um at, at a global stage i think it is and i think that's where the focus lies but how do you break down that culture of elitism from that early age uh, a, couple of, a couple of responses uh, i disagree with with your assertion that the bulk of, of, of resources is targeted at a performance sport. Um, we, I mentioned earlier on, 90% of the budget, both ours and local agencies, is for school and community sport. The, the remaining 5 to 10% is, we're probably the only agency that supports that 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 end of it, performance end. The word elitist doesn't apply. That's for your me. budget. Not, I mean, the total amount of money that's spent on sport in this country, including advertising revenue, sponsorships, all of that. You know, there's a lot of money targeted at the elite. If you're talking about some of the professional sports, that's that's something that we. That's that's. Just, that, I always think they're slightly separate. You have to look at them separately. Okay. Can I go back and address your yeah, your do. school issue? I, I. It's an offer to any member of the committee. We 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 could take you to your communities now and show you, I think, a different outlook. Um, our aspiration, what we see happening now in, in schools through integrated physical education uh, uh, lessons and programs, secondary PE teachers working with primary school teachers, the emphasis in those classroom sessions and those, those curriculum sessions being on equality, everyone getting an opportunity, having fun, but also learning. The active schools programs connecting the schools to the community again are open to all um, they're not about competition yes competition does exist but it's not about that so i see a completely different world at that level uh, and it's our job and i think we've made some progress active school has been in place for 12 years that kind of sustained investment i think is a real positive community sport hubs we've now been working for for six seven years on community sport hubs sustained investment in how we tackle that, and it's not based on exclusivity. We're trying, our ambition is to get every single child capacity withstanding, because that's the one thing, back to the question you asked earlier on, the capacity is one of the issues that we've all got to focus on, people and space, to try and get more, more people active. But I would, as I say to anyone around the room, I'm happy to come and show you in your own communities the difference in, in, in that aspect. I'm not saying that wasn't your experience. But for me, I see a different thing now in schools and communities across Scotland. Yeah, hi. Thanks, convener. Um, thanks for coming along. Um, a couple of things I wanted to touch on. Just firstly, before we leave the issue around about schools, um, is there an issue there? Um, you can tell me to what extent this is true. Because of the, the PFI model, was you in a position where access, and, if you own the school, clearly you can get in any time, but it was under the PFI model, it's a kind of pay-to-play sort of situation. Is that an issue, that is one of the issues that prevents access in those facilities? It has been an issue. I don't yeah. think it's as big an issue. Right. I think there are schools that have been, have been funded by whatever means. Mm -hmm. I personally don't look at that too much. Sure. I just want the space accessible. 
Um, and if there are difficult conversations to have, that's what these strategic partnerships are locally about having those, 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 those partnerships. I think there's a lot of schools that have been built like that are now accessible. There may be others of the older fraternity that may be slightly less bound and slightly more bound in contractual stuff that's more difficult to get around. But we're constantly, I can assure you, constantly working to improve that capacity in every single authority across the country, regardless of how it was built or funded. So you're, those contractual arrangements are getting challenged where it where it needs to be, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, it was just to go back to something you said right at the start, round about the, the, the Active Scotland framework, and you said, um, and you made some big claims for that, being a kind of world-beaten system, etc. Do you know, we just want to talk a wee bit more about how that kind of works and why you see it as being so advanced in yeah. terms of how everyone else in the world does this? Well, it, it, actually, it actually came about three or four years ago um, when... From our perspective, we felt that sports, sport in, in Scotland was being asked to do its own job plus a whole host of others. Now, that's great. We'll take that, we'll take that on where we can. But with the resources we have, the challenge is probably too big. My professional and personal view is that if you're going to look at changing behaviour and make Scotland an active nation, it needs a policy um, which is very clear uh, about getting from one end. I'll give you the two ends of the spectrum. There's a whole bunch of things in the middle about the inactive, getting the more active, right up to those who are involved in performing sport. In the middle, there's skill acquisition, but how do we give people, it doesn't matter their age, the ability, the tools to actually participate at the level they want to participate at. There's a whole dashboard of measures in there. Yes, some of them are flat. There's not many going the wrong direction. And for me, uh, there was a, a, a survey that came out recently which said that in in infrastructure and policy terms, Scotland was in second place. We still have to make sure that that is connected to actual impact. And my belief, and it's, a, it's, it's something I've, I've been talking about a lot, is we will only <coughs> achieve that when the partnership of portfolios, of sectors, health, education, transport, sport, and anyone else we can contribute actually come together to work in a coordinated way to make that happen and then we'll begin to see things but having the policy and actually the infrastructure and many of the measures in place as a first first principle uh, i think is fantastic and rather than expecting sport to do everything on its own uh, and, and cover all of those those areas uh, with, with the resources we have this is a much bigger corporate uh, societal public sector driven yeah hopefully we'll get some commercial support as well but public sector driven and led for communities and, and, and the people of Scotland. I just think it's got real opportunity, um, but okay. we've got to realise it. Uh, and that we've been continuing to talk to our minister, how important we see that, and if, if she can have influence on other ministers to bring some of that together. Okay, thanks. Hey, thanks, Simon. Uh, Richard. Thank you, Kendina. Um I actually had a meeting with a local uh, amateur football team on Sunday night and basically the you know if we go down to the cost basically you know there's a lot of clubs out there who um when members get together they'll chip in a pound you know and and that pays for for what so you know people there's a lot of good clubs out there that are doing a lot of work um could you know let's talk about cost how are we compared to other countries and the charges that have been made uh to to you know for people to access you you've got a lot of you know in my local authority you've got passport to leisure you've got you know they actually have um the the local authority um sport uh has actually increased in in north Lancashire over the last number of years so cost wise where are we compared to other countries it's, it's kind of difficult to compare like for like we don't think we've got that that data but we we regularly look at costs and again we've got a number of reports over years that will look at the cost comparisons across the different parts of Scotland and we can make that available for you if, if, if you wish as, as well. The cost can be an issue uh, and when that happens I think people locally should go and ask the question why. Um, we're happy to be involved in those, those conversations because we think sport Physical activity will only be successful if there's a transparent two-way conversation locally. Uh, we will help to facilitate that uh, and we'll try and make sure um, that there's, there's an answer given. Um, 
one of the things, just another example, recently, but I was up in Shetland, we just put in, and then helped, helped add to an indoor space, a new indoor 3G 60 by 40, which for the islands of Shetland, it could be fantastic. Lots of people were a bit skeptical about it being expensive. But one of the side benefits of this early, early use is that the groups that have been going along, they found themselves expanding because people really loved the opportunity. The collective cost was then lessened to each individual and the whole thing was much more vibrant. But the essence of your question is, if cost is an issue, that for me is something that is a strategic issue. So therefore, we need to talk about it locally. Each local authority is different about how they profile it. So we have to, to look at this uh, uh, closely. So uh, be... I was also, if you allow me, convener, I was also at an, an area partnership meeting on Thursday night in my local area, where an interesting comment by an official was that someone came along and said, wait a minute, this park is is, is ours, it's the public's, it's not the council's, you know, so give me a key to get into it so I can bring my kids, you know, and the council actually did it because, you know, and I know there's a, a point of trust or whatever, you know, to get the key back, I suppose, but, but the physical situation is all these facilities that are councils actually belong to the, pub, the public. Okay, I know PFI comes into some of the, the, the equation, but you know, how do we get, how do we build up that trust with the local community in order to generate, that's yours. You can, you know, if it's a play area, a kid can go to a play area and play in the play area. But if it's a football park, somebody puts up a fence and locks a gate after five o'clock. So how do we resolve that? Well, we did have a little bit of a disagreement about that earlier on, but for me, that, that a lot of that is the future. Uh, not exclusively. I think there's a real balance between managed and commercially operated facility space with programs that are different type, but also we should give the communities the opportunity to run and manage their own facilities. It's part of that strategic look. Uh, part of that responsibility, though, is how they then would manage the cost of it. And for me, that's an exciting area to look at, about how we take that club model, and that's the essence of it, is to give more power to the clubs and sports themselves to run their own activities. Every single community sport hub is like that. It's run by a coalition of local people who actually manage that, that facility. So Armadale, the sports hub in Armadale is, for me, is a great example. 30 different groups and clubs, not all traditional serious sport, lots of recreational stuff in there. But it's a group of local people with some young people helping to staff the facility that drives it. Now, I just think we're at the early stages of that model and more and more community management, community ownership in partnership with local agencies is the way forward. I take on board what you're saying about the cost of that, but I think it could help in lots of ways to allow the community to run these things themselves. Yeah. Thank you, Kizia. Clear. Thank you very much and thank you, panel. And can I just say, I've been really heartened to hear um, how Sports Scotland are thinking outside of silos, that you're talking about working, jo joined up working with, with other agencies um, and uh, about uh, how much work you're doing at grassroots. I know in my own community there's a huge amount of work being done at grassroots and community hubs. Um, and we really have a, a local volunteers to thank for that because lots of people do dedicate a lot of time and I think they deserve um, some recognition for that. But I'm actually going to move on and talk to you a little bit or ask you a little bit about Brexit and what you think the impact of that is going to be on sport in Scotland. Um, how significant do you think that issue is going to be to sport here and what sports do you think will be most impacted? Well, the formal feedback we, we've given is would, would be around, and this because sport is largely devolved, um, the bulk of what we do is in our own hands. Um, so 95% of that is in our own hands. So th that will depend on how the economy works and, and how things are from a government policy perspective going forward. So we'll put that to one side. The one thing we did look at, though, from a high performance, and I, I'm careful not to use the word elitist because it's mm -hmm. performance, um, the movement, the free movement of specialist coaches and staff who can help teach us, bring us to the next level, may well be impacted. Um, so from that perspective, we see that as being the, as we sit here today, goodness knows what's going to happen down the track. But for me, that's the one thing that we see could impact at that performance end. But the rest of it depends on our own decisions, our own economy, 
and how things things go forward. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, there's a recognition that it's, it's more likely to impact on the more professional, if we, if we look at it that way, professional uh, uh, sports. It's that movement of, of specialists. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the movement of, uh, in particular, in, in sports like uh, football and uh, rugby uh, players, and as you see, um, coaching staff. Have you had any discussions with governing bodies about how this may well work? Um, and, or, or with some of the, the, the clubs or, or major organisations about the impact that it might have on them? Not really. I mean, I think part of the challenge is uh, here is that uh, ourselves included don't, don't really know what, what, what's going to happen. So therefore it's, it's difficult. So there's been some preliminary discussions, um, uh, uh, but it's still so much up in the air. But it's in, it's in that area and I think we have to have, have further discussions and ongoing discussions as the situation develops. Uh, uh, with the UK government. Okay. And, and looking ahead then, have you looked at how um, a potential loss of EU funding might impact on sport in Scotland? I mean, I think we, we, we don't get so much EU funding, but there are, there, you know, there's a number of programmes I know that some of our partners have, like Erasmus, for example, that, that, that that's going to be uh, affected. Um, and um, although the UK government is saying that money would come to replace that, that, there's no guarantee that that would happen. So again, in my previous answer, it's really it's, so much of this is up in the air. It's very difficult to, to, to actually say. So I don't think there'll be a, a huge impact, particularly in sports, Scotland from, e, e, from, from EU funding, but possibly on some of the other sports. But I think it's an area that we have to sp uh, create, you know, some focus on uh, going forward. But, it, but it, as, as you know, it, the situation changes kind of week on week. So um, it, it, it's difficult for us to give a definitive answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Brian. Um, thank you, convener. Can I just start by sta stating that I think this place um, uh, struggles to understand how to leverage sport and the impact of sport can I also state that I think sport in this country is chronically underfunded and that Sports Scotland do a remarkable job with the money that they have and the buck actually should stop in this parliament here. I think cutting the sports budget goes unseen and it's really easy to do. And it also includes uh, the sports budgets within councils as well. Uh, speaking to your point, convener, about, about the cost of access to sport, there is undeniably uh, a cost of access to sport. Um, uh, I'm thinking specifically, from, you know, I, I was in the uh, indoor arena at the Emirates last night, which is smack back in the middle of the east end of Glasgow, and it's £3.50 to get in. Um, so, um, although we have some phenomenal facilities, uh, it, it, there's, there's a struggle to access, and you're absolutely right. Can I say that I think that uh, the ability to, to, to access the opportunity to be active, if it's reduced, the result is, is a cost or a pressure on health and on education, on transport, on welfare. Sorry, can, we, sorry, can sorry, I just sorry. ask, is Mr. Mr. No, Buckle here to make sorry, a statement sorry. or ask a question? I'm just going to say that, Brian. Maybe you need to yes, I'm getting to questions. a question. Could be now. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm just asking just now. And we do have limited time as well. Yeah. In other words, cutting a sports budget, is, uh, I think, is, is a false economy. So to, to ask you, uh, Merlin Stewart, um, if you were properly funded over a longer term, how, how, would, how would that impact the way sport's done in this country? Um, yeah. I don't know, but properly funded. If we, I, I, I'm, I'm a kind of believer you need to in, invest in sport, and what will happen is, is you'll get long-term benefits. So it becomes part of the overall Active Scotland uh, framework. We have greater input there. But then you can start doing more initiatives. So you could start to say, if you had more money, you could say, right, we're going to subsidise uh, um, uh, access into into uh, arenas, as you mean, uh, for certain people on certain income levels or certain areas where it's costing zero to come in, so that they're actually uh, encouraged to come in. And if they don't have the money, they can do. But you require to have funds to do that. Um, so I I think uh, in increased investment in sport across the board will have greater impact in all aspects of society. So you've got a healthier nation, more active nation, more people participating, um, and we could put funds in the, in the appropriate places in the same way that we're, we're doing at the moment. The system we have, I, I believe the system is right. That's why other countries are starting to go, what's going on in Scotland is, is really interesting. And to, to your first point in your, in your, in your comment, this is something we should be really proud of in this, in this country. It's something we should be t talking to the world about. Hey, you know, this is what's going on here on a relatively small budget and actually impacts have been made. You've got to remember that this health uh, challenge is a global one. It's not just Scotland, it's everywhere. 
and, and, and we are ahead of the game. People are starting to notice it. So we, we should be investing more, in, in my opinion. I'm, I'm bound to say that I'm sitting as the chair of Sports Scotland, and I'm sure other organisations would as well. But I just fundamentally, passionately believe that if you make Scotland a sports nation, the benefits to society will be it's really, really significant. For a small, tiny investment, you get much better, times 10, times 20 back in terms of the impact for your society. Okay, yep. Can I also ask, and, and um, you've been asked a lot today about the uh, the targets around uh, participation, etc. My, my question is, do you, do you have sufficient resource uh, to hand to give an in-depth report that's being requested here in this committee? Um, we, we have a lot of information, Brian, and I think it would be good for the committee to, to have a good look at that. And then if there are gaps, then we'll look at how we fill those gaps. We take a prioritisation approach to that, though. Um, so those areas that we think we need to look at, we'll look at them anyway, uh, because they're, they're really important. I guess if I have to go back to that system approach, we've got so much belief in that system approach that it has to be the group of partners collectively. And I think there's some mileage there where all of us together could probably look at how measurement actually happens uh, ac across across the piece. So, Could I raise it just a, yep. on a point there, because I think it's important. When that system, the percentage of children who meet physical activity recommendations uh, 2014 to 2015 has gone down for boys 2.5%, girls 55 and all children 39 Is that evidence of a system that's working? Um, the, these statistics are they're there they're in the public domain. What we are seeing in schools across Every school we look at, and again, we'll pull out every single one to look at them, about how, how we improve on, on the results from a year-to-year -year basis. But, they, but, but you've, you've sold us this morning the system, and that the system is excellent, and everybody's looking at us across the world and all the rest of it, but the evidence of its impact on children is that the system ain't working. Well, we're building a system. We never said it was finished at the end of the day. I mean, we are building a system. We're, we're kind of, you, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, the bottom line is, I think, with 12 years invest, twelve years of investment in active schools, we think that's that's shown a lot of progress. Last four or five years, we're seeing continuing increases in participation, but it doesn't include it's every not, single it's one. It's back. Um, I, 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 I understand the sort of national measures and the picture, the snapshot they have. And I'm also, all I'm trying to explain is what we do around every school in the country and about what that looks like and what the participation is in those areas. But clearly there's a, a difference between your perception and what's being reported, and that's, that is a problem. Sorry, Brian, final, final question. Just, uh, could, could, just on, actually on that, that point there. Um, being at the coalface, um, and I've heard it discussed in here about capacity, um, would you agree there is an issue with capacity? in that now, uh, I've, I've never seen anything like it in my life, with so many clubs now, with so many kids wanting to participate, but there is waiting lists in so many sports just now, and actually it's the capacity, especially in terms of legacy from the Commonwealth Games, it's capacity is one of the things we really have to target. Capacity and infrastructure, I think we've said it a couple of times, we agree. Um, it's how much more space can we have, how can we make better use of the space that's available, and do we have enough people to keep to, to look after that, and we'll continue to try and build that, uh, and, and go in that, that positive direction. It will always be an enabler. If, if you don't enable, it doesn't happen. You don't achieve the outcome. So, people, and places, space, enable participation and progression, and that's what we think uh, needs to be continually worked on. It. The average volunteer will last three years, and then they'll move on and do something different. So we have to keep refreshing that and working to make it better. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Could, could I just kind of add very, very briefly? Yeah, just uh, thank you. Just, just to your point, and, and picking up on uh, Brian, Brian Whittle's point, is is that um, I, I would challenge some of the figures that you're, you're talking about. We will provide some figures for, to, to 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 the committee based on what we, we see as increased participation, particularly amongst young people. Um, and there is an issue around capacity. I know, for example, anecdotally in Glasgow, gymnastics has, has, has suddenly taken off. Um, and, and there's waiting lists to get in, in, in gymnastics. All these kids want to be gymnasts, um, which is a really, really fantastic, fantastic story. So this, the, the, the feedback we get in terms of participation is very positive. So we have to sit down together and have a look at how these figures are being... Uh, Scottish uh, Health Survey. Uh, all right, I know, yep, I, I'm aware of that. How they're arrived at 
and, and, and our figures and sit down and, and, and compare and contrast. And certainly our view is that participation is increasing in all these groups all across the country. Okay, gentlemen, thanks very much for your evidence this morning. As agreed earlier, we'll go into private session now.